Polyergus ants, also known as Amazon ants, are notorious for their raiding and colonizing behavior. These ants have lost the instinct to properly care for their offspring and feed themselves because they have evolved to entirely rely on other ants doing their work for them. The Polyergus ants will launch full-scale raids on other ant nests. During these invasions, they will slaughter the opposing ants that get in the way of them trying to capture their babies. After they've successfully destroyed all opposing ants, they effectively capture the baby ants and sometimes capture the adult ants too. At this point, the Polyogus ants will either take the ants that they've captured back to their nest, or they'll just entirely take over the ant nest they were attacking. If they do the latter, the Polyogus ant queen will replace the old queen for the previous ant colony and take over her position. Then the Polyogus ants will wait for the baby ants that they have captured to hatch. Once these baby ants hatch and turn into adult ants, they will become slaves to the Polyogus ants and put to endless work. These enslaved ants will now have to bear the responsibility of foraging for food, maintaining the nest, and caring for the Polyogus ant queen and her babies. Essentially, the enslaved ants will become the new crux for the colony, and these ants will have to handle all of the responsibilities of the Polyogus ants. In short, the entire colony fully depends on the enslaved ants to function. Having said that, you're probably wondering whether or not there has ever been a slave ant rebellion. And to answer that question, Yes, of course. They actually happen pretty often. Researchers observed that enslaved ants often grow to become fed up with oppressors, and once the enslaved ants are fully fed up with their enslavers, they will rebel against the ants who enslaved them by performing mass sabotages. Enslaved ants perform the sabotages by killing the pupae of the opposing ant species, neglecting the offspring of the opposing ant species, and sometimes just straight up attacking the opposing ant species' babies on sight whenever they see them. Whether or not these sabotages work to liberate the enslaved ants varies on a variety of factors. But nonetheless, the enslave your friendly neighbors method has become so notorious with certain ant species that it started an evolutionary arms race between invasive ants and ants that defend their home. With that being said, unfortunately, I don't think the ants are innocent in this situation. So I'll have to rule the ants as guilty for one count of involuntary servitude and one count of kidnapping. We'll go over the rest of their charges and their sentencing for their crimes at the end of this video, but for now, they're definitely guilty of these two crimes. These are the next serious crimes these ants are being accused of. In tropics of Asia and Australia, the weaver ants make a follow-up to this list with their very questionable work ethics. Weaver ants live in large nests formed on top of trees by the use of leaves and glue. The weaver ants find leaves on the tree, hold them together, then glue them sealed tight with glue to form a formidable and cozy nest their colony can reside in. For the most part, this doesn't necessarily sound too bad, but it's only when you take a closer look into the weaver ants' work policies that you realize that's something extremely off. Where exactly do the weaver ants get their huge amounts of glue from? I'm glad you asked. While building the nest, the weaver ants hold the leaves together and then grab their larvae and squeeze them tightly with their mandibles so that they can produce silk. As the larvae begin producing silk threads, the weaver ant holding the larvae will quickly turn the baby ant into a literal living glue gun, making it glue the leaves of their nest shut. After the weaver ants are done using their larvae as glue, they'll go on to simply return them back to the brood chamber of their colony, where the baby ants can resume life normally, totally not traumatized by the event. No, but seriously, the larvae are usually never hurt in this process and majority of them naturally go on to live normal, healthy lives. So I guess the ants are innocent in regards to negligence. But nonetheless, I'll still have to rule the ants as guilty for one count of FLSA violation and one count of exploitation. Coming back to the topic of slavery, you could also say that ants enslave other species too, like aphids. However, when it comes to aphids, the conquest is a little bit different compared to others. Interestingly enough, researchers have debated whether or not ants are actually enslaving aphids or just simply herding them like farmers. When you take a look at it, it's actually a pretty wholesome process. The farmer ants find aphids then herd like cattle and put them underneath leaves in order to protect them from predators like wasps and hoverfly larvae. In exchange for their protection, aphids will produce a sweet sugary substance from their backside for the ants to enjoy. It sounds pretty weird and gross, but it's called honeydew. And honestly, from a practical view, the relationship between ants and aphids 
really just seems like a mutualistic one, where both of the species benefit from each other's presence. However, um, that's where things get a little strange. Researchers have observed that sometimes aphids actually show signs of not wanting to participate in the ants' antics. But, despite not wanting to be herded, ants will use a unique chemical on their feet to tranquilize and subdue the aphid into being herded. This isn't just a thing that happened once or twice before, it happens very often. Many researchers allude that this process is probably how ants are able to generally herd aphids. The ants essentially just turn the aphids into a food farm that gives them sweet honeydew, their personal favorite. So in conclusion, the relationship is beneficial for both of the species. But regardless of that fact, it doesn't necessarily matter. Whether or not aphids benefited from the presence of ants is irrelevant because they don't have a choice in the matter. The aphids just have to sit and be forced into being a honeydew dispenser without the ability to do anything about it, sort of like those things from All Tomorrows. With this being said, I'll have to rule the ants as guilty of another count of kidnapping and one count of aggravated assault for tranquilizing the aphids. According to the FDA, fire ants, an invasive species in North America, are responsible for $5 billion in damage to the US alone. These costs are spent on medical treatment, damages to property, and attempts to control and suppress extremely infested areas. Although they're not inherently bad, fire ants as an invasive species can be pretty dangerous to their environment by their ability to damage crops, harm and blind small pets, and cause irreparable damages to homes. And this isn't only fire ants that do this either. Ants, as an invasive species in general, can cause a lot of trouble for the people they're around. A lady in Edmonton had to face the frightening possibility of bankruptcy because her house was infested with tens of thousands of carpenter ants. The lady became aware of the problem in the first place when she noticed that some ants were suspiciously going in and out of a newly formed hole in her wall. This prompted her to take the wall down so that she could investigate where they were coming from. When she took the wall down, she was greeted with thousands of live ants running rampantly around in the exposed wall. Having this concern her even further, the woman decided to fully tear down the entire wall, and to her horror, she witnessed the wonderful discovery of a humongous carpenter ant colony going all the way up to the ceiling of her house. And then the ants ate her. I'm kidding. But on a more serious note, the lady had to face $100,000 in repairs just to make her house livable again which reasonably devastated her considering that this was the first house she had ever bought in her life. However, to end on a positive note, around 60 volunteers heard of the woman's story in Edmonton, which prompted them to attempt to rescue her home. Together, the 60 volunteers were able to accomplish around $100,000 worth of work on the house, effectively removing infestation from the house, along with other issues. From being frightened at the possibility of actually losing her house to ants, this lady was fortunate enough to be able to keep it thanks to the kindness of a couple volunteers. And she's actually doing pretty good now. Still, however, we'll have to rule the ants as guilty of one count of vandalism. In summary, ants in this case are guilty with two counts of kidnapping, one count of involuntary servitude, one count of a fair labor standards violation, one count of exploitation, one count of aggravated assault, and lastly, one count of vandalism. In total, they're guilty of seven crimes which ranks them as evil in our codex, making them the most malevolent species we've covered as of yet. I don't see them coming out of jail anytime soon, 